Here are three vintage oscilloscopes, one you've already seen if you watched the first uh, in this series, the SC3100 by Syncor. Uh, most of that was about uh, making up some probes that would work with the special features of the Syncor. Uh, if you haven't seen that one and you're interested in that sort of thing, you might go back and look at it. Uh, we're going to we're going to talk about the SC3100 a little bit, but not a great deal. Uh, a little more time we'll spend on these two. On the left is the Heathkit IO103, and in the middle is the Syncor PS163. Now, the reason that I'm showing all three of these scopes is this is an evolution, if you will, of service scopes. That is, scopes intended for people in the service industry. I started out back in high school working on TVs, and for a short time in college, I uh, repaired TVs to earn some uh, tuition money and so on. But by and large, I got out of the service business uh, even before I got my, my first uh, engineering degree. And so I more or less was a, a sideline observer in this area for a long time. But nonetheless, this is a little bit of the evolution. The scope on the left I built from a kit in, I think, 1971. Uh, I, I got my bachelor's degree in 74, so at that time I was still sometimes doing some service work. The 163, uh, my recollection is this came out in the 80s, uh, early 80s, and the 3100 was the 90s. So <clears throat> this is sort of the evolution. Uh, the one on the left is the first triggered sweep oscilloscope that I ever owned. The 163 was sort of the transition from single trace, low bandwidth, uh, often not even triggered, sometimes just synchronized sweep, to a full dual channel uh, oscilloscope with uh, triggered sweep and uh, fairly wide bandwidth and so on. We'll talk about that a little more. And then the 3100 was a 100 megahertz scope with all kinds of automated measurement features that by the 90s the big problem that service centers had were was getting trained technicians so they wanted to be able to train somebody up pretty quickly so the more automation you could have in a, in a piece of test equipment the better things were but most of this is just war stories I've heard from people who ran uh, service departments and service centers, so I don't really have any direct uh, experience myself. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this heath kit in on my workbench and calibrate it. It appears to be uh, working. On each scope is the calibration signal. You'll see there the uh, on the heath kit it's a kind of a clipped sine wave. On the other two, it's a nice square wave, which is a lot easier to work with. Back in the 70s, it was harder to generate square waves, so uh, they went generally with just a signal taken off the AC line and uh, reduced down to, in this case, it's supposed to be one volt peak to peak, and all of these, uh, that's, I think, what they're showing. So anyway, let's go on and get this, uh, this heath kit calibrated, and then we'll come back and talk about each one of them. Here's the Heath kit oscilloscope opened up for calibration. I've done some basic tests to make sure that the unit appears to be working correctly. It's been years since I've used this scope, but I uh, hope to be able to calibrate it and get it back to its normal operating condition and include it in the uh, vintage oscilloscopes uh, series that I've been doing. This was the first triggered sweep oscilloscope that I owned. Before this I had an ICO that I had built, a 460, that I built in the late 50s and used for many years until I bought this kit I think in 1971. So let me get on with the calibration. There's the manual. And 
The nice thing about these old kits is they had a comprehensive manual with them. So it wasn't hard to, uh, to work on or, uh, of course, since you built the scope, you pretty much knew how it worked and had a schematic and everything. So love to work on these things. I realize they're way out of date for today's use, but uh, sure a lot of fond memories. A lot of stuff that I used this scope on from the 70s through the 80s until I got uh, some better equipment and then unfortunately had to retire this to the uh, to the back shelf. So anyway, let's get on with uh, calibrating this scope. I have all three scopes set up now and on each of the screens is a video signal that is the old NTSC coming from that generator and the reason that I chose an NTSC signal to illustrate these three oscilloscopes is since all three of these were intended for the television service market primarily I thought that was an appropriate signal to display. The Heathkit, as I pointed out, came out in the very early 70s, I think 1970 or 71. I think I built this kit in uh, either late 1971 or early 1972. A lot of the changes in oscilloscopes for the service industry came about because of the way that receivers were made and the things you needed to do to uh, be able to test and uh, repair them. This is a very early uh, General Electric and I chose that for a reason you'll see in a minute. And it's uh, entirely implemented with vacuum tubes. And you see that on the waveform it indicates the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude and the frequency and by the frequency that meant the frequency that the scope was operating on because back in the day there were no triggered sweep oscilloscopes available for the service industry. What you did instead was you set a, a horizontal sweep oscillator to a frequency and then you uh, added a sync signal derived from the input of the scope to try to lock the signal in. I say try because it was actually rather challenging. And I remember back in the 60s when I was still in high school and working in a television repair shop, I had a Nyko 460 oscilloscope, which was one of the better ones of the day, uh, at least uh, of those that were affordable. And it was very difficult often to lock on to these signals. So a lot of the time was spent just getting the oscilloscope to lock up so that you could look at the signal. But nonetheless, that was typical of the 1950s, which predate all of these oscilloscopes. And there is the TV that I've been talking about, and it's a General Electric Model 17T10. By the time that I got this scope, TVs had started to be transistorized. And this is a General Electric chassis. In fact, I own this TV, uh, the 19YA. And as you see from the date down here, this was a 1976, December of 1976 set. I worked on that particular set with this oscilloscope. In fact, I discovered that there was a uh, yoke uh, short in the set. Uh, this was several years after I bought it. And I went in to talk to the uh, people at the service center, which also was the GE distribution center, to get a new yoke and uh, they offered me a job. I didn't take it because by then I was working in, uh, in electronics. I had my uh, degree, uh, which I got in 74, my bachelor's degree. But this is typical of the service literature of that time. 
Now you'll notice here that unlike the other first set, you're now looking at discrete transistors. Once again, the oscilloscope traces that are shown display a peak-to-peak -peak level, but you may notice that they've stopped putting the frequency on there because with a triggered sweep oscilloscope, frequency isn't the issue. You lock the signal using a trigger and then you adjust the time base of the oscilloscope to give you what kind of uh, display you're looking for. You can look at part of it or all of it at the same time. By then, manufacturers had started including these troubleshooting check charts and things like that because one of the reasons that the GE uh, Service Center was uh, interested in hiring me is they, they admitted that they were having trouble finding people who could even isolate a yoke problem, much less uh, do it in any efficient way. That was kind of the state of the industry in 1976 uh, or in the 70s. Technicians had started becoming scarce, good technicians. And one of the problems that the service industry always had, and understand, I was, I was only in the industry back in high school and for a brief period during college, uh, so I'm not an expert, but from what I read and, and what I've seen talking to people, and I used to subscribe to some magazines like PF Reporter, which is the PhotoFact uh, magazine that was put out by Howard W. Sams, the people that, that generated all of this literature, and most of the complaints from service center managers were that they were having trouble getting good technicians. Most of the complaints from consumers were that they couldn't find an honest service shop. Uh, servicing had become a cutthroat business by the 70s, and uh, there were a lot of people in the business who uh, fixed things by just hacking out parts and putting in more parts and charging the customer for all of that. And so the service industry was getting a real bad reputation by the 70s. Now, transistors started becoming prevalent. And eventually, televisions came to have integrated circuits. And you may notice from this that most of the service data now, this is a, a, a later, uh, I forgot to look at the date on this, uh, August of 2000, and this is a Samsung television, by the way, which I also own, and that's why I have this service literature, is these are sets that I've owned over the years. I would always buy a service manual when I bought the set, so when it went out, because it always would, uh, I at least had something to work with. So these service instructions, you may notice, are mostly pictorials, and various uh, parts information and so on. They would include a schematic usually, but you may notice that a lot of the schematic was given over to things like this integrated circuit. And by this time, 2000, most manufacturers had gone over to modularized TVs. That was partly because of the lack of good service techs and also partly because the uh, space program and its offshoots had started to produce very reliable technology and most of the manufacturers had incorporated that in their in their sets. By the time the PS163 came out it was offering a special feature that you see down there where you could set the horizontal to at the horizontal rate, that is the sweep of the scope, to the TV horizontal rate or the TV vertical rate. In general, that was the improvement that was made was to the sync circuits to incorporate uh, horizontal and vertical sync separators and horizontal and vertical sweep generators. So while you could trigger these oscilloscope, this oscilloscope, uh, it was primarily 
designed to just operate off a video signal like that. Two channels began to be important and later when VCRs came out, they became very important because a lot of the adjustments in VCRs required that you trigger on one signal and adjust a second. The only one of these that I actually owned at the time was this Heath kit. I bought this uh, PS163 to complete uh, a set of Sencor test equipment. Same way with this SC3100. By the time this scope had come out, there was a lot of optimization to eliminate a lot of the need for much thought while working on TVs and you may notice that this one has that TV vertical and TV horizontal trigger mode and uh, sweep mode and it even has a special position for the trigger to uh, put in a sink separator and so on. By the time this scope had run its uh, course, which is the late 90s, service centers were going out of business all over. Most people at that point were starting to buy uh, TVs and when they broke they would just throw them away. And then of course shortly after this, digital television came out and obsoleted all of the NTSC TVs. I am a collector of this equipment and so I have tended to follow it and its progression. And to me, it's rather interesting to see that eventually the scopes got to the point that it was all push button. There's a list of test equipment recommended. See if I can find that. And pardon my fumbling around there. Uh, I eventually found the uh, test equipment listings. And you'll notice that the oscilloscope listed, recommended, is the Syncor 3100. That had sort of become the standard for at least the better service centers by the uh, by the 90s. And then a series of other RGB generator, uh, multi-burst signal generator, and in that case they're recommending a VG91, which I have a couple of those as well that I've refurbished. Uh, digital voltmeter, frequency meter, high voltage probe, accessory probe, and then uh, other uh, equipment, isolation transformer, CRT tester, and so on. Most of this stuff I have uh, collected over the years. You may notice there's the transistor tester TF46 that I used while troubleshooting the SM152, which is the sweet marker generator. And that's another thing that by the 90s had happened. There were no longer any uh, alignment necessary in TVs, what had happened is all of the uh, units were using integrated circuits. You see that this IC is labeled video or IF video, chroma, deflection, and there were no adjustments to speak of in terms of alignment. So unlike the days of the, of the 50s and 60s and even into the 70s, by the late 80s, you no longer had to align a TV. In fact, you couldn't even align a TV. It was all pre-aligned at the factory. So once again, if, uh, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, uh, just put that in a comment. I try to respond to comments. Uh, if you would like a little more information on any of this kind of equipment or other test equipment, that's the kind of thing that, that I like to uh, reminisce about. Almost no use for this stuff today unless you're renovating old TVs. And most of the old TVs that people work on, frankly, this scope on the far left is perfectly adequate. That is, if you're really interested in the vintage tube sets like this General Electric here. But for now, I think that's enough on uh, old oscilloscopes and how they were used in the service industry. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope you look forward to maybe another video in this uh, same vein.